Welcome to Resilient. My name is Mike Kearney, the Risk and Financial Advisory CMO. Over the past few weeks, I've been spending a lot of time with clients, hearing about the challenges that they are experiencing and responding to the crisis. That's why this new Resilient series is so important to me. We are focusing all of our attention on the evolving impact of COVID-19. And with the podcast, we can provide actionable guidance to help you respond to the crisis and start planning for the future. The pandemic has caused an unprecedented health and economic crisis that has put everything on hold. Today, we'll hear about the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act, the largest aid package in U.S. history, a stimulus relief designed to alleviate many of the impacts of COVID-19. And with this act and other measures, the U.S. government is taking broad actions to help individuals, businesses, healthcare organizations, federal, state, and local governments, and industries impacted by the crisis. There are a lot of questions regarding the CARES Act. Today, we are looking to give you some of the answers. I'm joined by three Deloitte leaders who have dissected the CARES Act from different angles. First, we have KP Kavitha Prabhakar, who leads our civil government sector. She is joined by Shahara Knight, who brings experience in government, public policy, and public affairs. KP and Shahara are both joined by Jonathan Traub, Managing Principal of our Tax Policy Group and former Staff Director for the Committee on Ways and Means of the U.S. House of Representatives. I know these three have been working night and day to distill the insights from this groundbreaking stimulus package. Let's hear what they have to say. So you all have been burning the midnight oil. Uh, I know that diving into the CARES Act and advising clients. And before we really get into the meat of this conversation, I would love to know what each of you are doing to manage your well-being during this challenging time. I'm going to start with KP. Thanks, Mike. Um, I will tell you, uh, the first thing I'm doing is actually working on a sleep, better sleep. The reason is I feel the work from home really pushes us in terms of the start and end day um, and having some regularity to it. So I'm working hard on getting enough sleep in. I've also been working on eating better. So those are my two things. I will have to say not flying every week is the silver lining for me in all of this. <laughs> uh, Shahira, how about you? What are you doing to manage your well-being? I am definitely trying very hard to squeeze in online yoga every day, even if it means I have to wake up you know, at 5 a.m. to do it. And I also, no matter um, how busy I am, I try to hit pause and give my dog belly rubs and ear scratches if he's looking for attention. <laughs> well, dogs are always good for that. Uh, Jonathan, how about you? Well, I've uh, tried to get out and ride my bike a little bit here and there, although I'm not having as much luck as I would like. And I like KP. I'm trying to sleep more. I find myself much more tired now than I was when I was you know, going to the office or being on airplanes. I don't know why, but I feel like I need more sleep. I'm certainly trying to accommodate that. I should uh, talk to you guys offline because uh, I like to sleep, but I don't do a very good job of it. So maybe maybe you're the ones that could advise me. But let's get into this. So KP, I'm going to start with you. Um, yeah. And now's where it gets serious. So what are some of the major themes uh, that you've distilled from the CARES Act? And maybe keep it a high level, but enough so that people get a sense for what's in it. Absolutely, Mike. So the CARES Act is uh, quite a sweeping and expansive bill, as you can imagine. So what we did was we took the bill and looked at it from kind of a human engagement, human experience perspective, also looked at the various industry perspectives uh, to better understand what themes are emerging. And, you know, you look at individuals, families, small businesses, employees, affected workers, whether they're COVID impacted or impaired um, industries, all are very much impacted, right? But looking at this through the lens that lets you see why this bill is all about getting money in the hands of the people as quickly as possible was important to us. It's all about providing emergency assistance to the economy immediately while we slow the spread of the virus and flatten the curve as we're all talking about in our nation. So KP, can you talk about what the four main themes that you've identified are? Sure. Um, The first is there's a substantial focus on helping individuals. So theme number one, think of it as helping individuals. 
that are most impacted by the virus. It provides assistance to workers who have been laid off or can't work for a variety of reasons. It extends much of this help to people who otherwise aren't eligible, such as self-employed individuals, independent contractors, or even gig workers in this day and age. Uh, the law also seeks to help people who are facing ev eviction or foreclosure. Finally, there's a lot of um, assistance to businesses. So helping businesses is the second theme and is tied to keeping workers on the payroll. And there we basically are talking about, um, you know, how do we help the economy broadly by helping businesses, right? Whether it's small businesses and nonprofits that are facing significant disruptions, um, due to the slowdown in economic activity, or it also aims to inject amount of liquidity into the market by allowing the Federal Reserve to essentially act as a lender of last resort to the entire business community. So that's in the helping businesses category. Uh, third is state and local governments that are facing significant costs as they respond to the healthcare crisis, right? I live in Chicago in Illinois, you know, every single small business here is impacted. My uh, community has all stores closed, whether that is for food related items, restaurants, whether it is for simple services, right? Um, so the CARES Act basically seeks to channel substantial federal funding into the states and municipalities to offset these costs, either directly or through federal agencies. The fourth theme is um, the CARES Act has included what has been called a Marshall Plan for hospitals. A major theme of the bill is to provide support to hospitals and the healthcare system and the frontline care workers that are putting their own lives at risk every day to help others. We're really grateful for this group. I mean, they are getting up every day to uh, fight this pandemic, and I do believe that the fourth theme really focuses on them. Shahir, I've got a question with regard to some previous legislation, and this CARES Act is being referred to as phase three, but there was a couple others prior to it. Can you take us through the legislation that has been passed to date and how we got to this third phase? Sure. This is called phase three, and it's because Congress basically passed bills in just 21 days to respond to this crisis, and they refer to the three bills as phase one, two, and three. But the first bill was really focused on the emergency funding to the healthcare agencies that are at the forefront of fighting the pandemic. And some of that funding also went to um, USAID to help with the global response as well. And then the second bill, phase two, really focused on providing aid to individuals. So the centerpiece of that bill was a tax credit for smaller employers to provide paid leave to workers who were impacted by the crisis. And then that bill also provided for free COVID-19 testing, and it increased funding for safety net programs like unemployment insurance and food nutrition assistance programs. And then that brought us to where we are today was with phase three, the CARES Act, which, um, as, as KP said, sweeping bill, $2.2 trillion, which has been described as the largest financial aid package in U.S. history. So one of the things I've been trying to do is limit the amount of TV <laughs> that I watch, although it's been on all morning as I've been working. Um, and there's a lot of conversation around potentially a next phase um, or more stimulus. Um, do you think there's going to be a fourth phase? I do. And I think the reason that Congress uses the, the language of phases rather than bills is because mm -hmm. they do want to signal to people that this wasn't one and done, that they were going to pass one bill and then move on. Um, the, the phase language is very intentional because Congress is going to continue to work on this and look at this and see what workers need, what businesses need, what the economy needs. So we are expecting a phase four and we may even have a phase five and a phase six. And I think Congress is already fast at work, working on a phase four bill. And so far, the types of things that they're looking at, it really has changed quite a bit over the past week, what they were looking at for phase four. But it looks like it's going to be a doubling down of the CARES Act that's in front of us now in terms of more funding and filling some of the gaps that they feel might have been left open. 
Are there any specific gaps that they're talking about at this point in time? Yeah, I think there are. For example, one of the really big provisions in the bill is is these loans to small businesses, which could be forgiven. And we have found that demand for these loans is astronomically high. And so I could see the next phase providing more funding for these bill for these small business loans. Um, I think they may also expand eligibility because in the implementation process, we found that some companies that might have been and you know, it might have been Congress's intent that they benefit from these loans. Um, they're finding that they don't benefit. So I think there will be fixes like that. I think there will also definitely be more funding to state and local governments, more funding for safety net programs. And I think certainly to KP's point, more support for the healthcare system overall. $2.2 trillion. It's almost hard, almost unfathomable to think about that. It's such a big number. Uh, Shuhar, can you just share what makes up that $2.2 trillion uh, within the CARES Act? Yeah, it is. And I think when there's a lot of zeros, you sometimes it's easy to lose perspective how big it is, but it's, it's 10% of the economy. So it's, it's very big. Um, but of that 2.2 trillion, the largest chunk of it, 908 billion is aid to businesses in the form of either loans, loan guarantees or grants. And about 61 billion of that amount is targeted to the airline industry. But the rest of it is not industry specific. It's available Mm. to businesses of all sizes in any sector. And some of it's also available to nonprofits. And then about 591 billion is tax benefits, about evenly divided between individuals and businesses. Another 492 billion is new federal funding um, to federal agencies, but then also to state and local governments. And then the last big chunk is $260 billion for unemployment insurance benefits, which, as KP already noted, it, it's an expansion of benefits in terms of size, length, and eligibility for unemployment insurance. Let's move to Jonathan. Jonathan, we're going to get to tax. Um, and I've heard that there are some tax relief provisions in this bill, uh, and they were way more robust than expected. Can you share some of the highlights? Yeah, it's interesting. When the bill was being developed, there was a lot of concern in the business community that Congress would do a round of checks for individuals, have a big loan uh, guarantee, uh, which Shahira and KP kind of outlined, and then sort of leave the rest of the business community waiting for more later. And in fact, they did not do that. What we saw was a fairly robust tax title of a number of provisions designed to provide immediate liquidity benefits to companies hurt by the coronavirus-induced downturn. So leading among those is a provision allowing businesses to carry back losses from 2020 into a prior tax year, effectively giving them access to previously paid taxes, Mm -hmm. Um, a provision allowing the acceleration of AMT credits, uh, provisions allowing companies to delay paying a portion of payroll taxes, giving them additional liquidity benefits for keeping people on the payroll. So it ended up being, as you say, Mike, accurately, a pretty robust tax title. Um, It doesn't do everything that everybody wanted, but it was certainly more uh, more expansive than many people expected when this process got underway. Jonathan, what's your sense as to the impact that we'll make? Obviously, you just said that it's maybe not as expansive as everybody would like, but, but will it make a significant impact? What's your sense of that? Well, I think it's it's hard to isolate this as what does this do or what does the unemployment right. provision do or what does the Marshall Plan for Healthcare do? I think you have to look at it as an integrated package and it, you know, roughly $2.2 trillion. Um, it's an enormous share of the economy, as Shahira said, about one-fifth of the U.S. economy. Because really the, the goal here, it, it, this is not a stimulus bill, right? A stimulus bill, you are encouraging economic activity. This is actually trying to freeze economic activity mm. until it's safe for people to go back out and f- get on airplanes or go to hotels or go to theme parks or bars or restaurants. And so uh, it's impossible to look at any one aspect in isolation. It's, it's really a, a comprehensive effort by the Congress and the administration to do what they can do to keep the administration, to keep the economy alive while putting it in suspended animation. And I think the fact that we're talking already about a phase four or maybe it's a phase 3.1, depending on whether it's new thinking or as Shahira says, maybe just an expansion of what we saw in phase three suggests uh, policymakers on both sides of the aisle recognize that the severity and depth of the economic hit from coronavirus uh, is going to require additional steps beyond the three we've already seen. 
how long were they thinking? If we're thinking about holding the economy over for a period of time, I guess that there was some time frame that was built into this. I don't know that. I mean, some of the provisions are last for the entire year. So the, the provision allowing employers to forgo paying a portion of payroll taxes goes to the end of this calendar year. Unemployment benefit expansions goes, I think, fully to the end of this year. Um, other provisions are much more short term. There's a paycheck protection program, loan program for smaller businesses that is tied to eight weeks or I think 10 weeks of payroll. Hey, Jonathan, one more uh, question on the tax code. Do you expect that there's going to be other changes down the road? And what what actions can companies take today um, if in fact there's going to be? I do expect future tax code changes. Um, Although what we're hearing about right now tend to be less business focused and more individual focused. One item that hasn't gotten enough attention, I think, on the business side is the treatment of canceled debt. Normally, if somebody writes off debt that you owe them, that canceled debt counts as income to whoever's loan is forgiven. Mm -hmm. And we saw in the 2008, 2009 downturn, Congress put some rules around that to relax the impact of making people take taxable income on forgiven debt. I would expect at some point in the process for that to get looked at. Um, but I do think the next phase, if it proceeds like Shahira suggests, which is more like phase 3.5 rather than a new 4.0, will likely not be heavy on business tax pieces. I think it'll be, uh, I think more likely to have uh, another round of checks for individuals before it has a, a substantial additional business tax component. Let's move back to KP. KP, obviously a number of governmental agencies are going to play a key role in administering the CARES Act um, and deciding how to disperse the funds, how they're managed and how they're accounted for. Um, can you talk about who the key players are? Are there new agencies or new groups being spun up or is this being pushed through existing agencies? Maybe if you could just share how all of this is being managed. Absolutely, Mike. So, um, you know, similar to some of the prior recoveries, you think about 2008 or even before, the government will play a very key role in administering the programs and how these funds are dispersed, managed, and accounted for. Um, I will talk about this probably in four buckets, right? Okay. There's the administration, there's the expansion of programs, there's oversight, and then how things flow to state, local, um, municipalities, right? Right. Um, I think those are the buckets that I think it's worth talking about this. There's also a sense of urgency that's reflected in this bill, right? We want liquidity to be out there. So movement has to happen uh, and has to happen quickly of funds. Um, I think the one other thing I'll say more broadly, Mike, is there are some things that are clear in the bill and some things that are being figured out. So, um, you know, everybody... Ha- Staying patient as regulations and clarifications, additional guidance comes through is going to be very important as we all interact with the government. Um, so in terms of administration overall, the government is using existing programs as much as possible to expedite sending the money as opposed to standing up new programs. Uh, for instance, we talked about the SBA program. Shahira mentioned that the government will play a key role in enhancing and administering the program, including new banks that could participate in the program. Some of them may not have supported the SBA program before. Um, let's talk about the Treasury and the role the Treasury uh, will play. For instance, one, the Treasury will look at addressing direct payments to individuals. Um, there is focus on standing up employee retention, a tax credit program. Um, overseeing the tax provisions in the bill that Jonathan talked about, loans and payments to airlines and other industries that are critical to our national security will go through the Treasury. And then managing money that will go into the Fed for liquidity um, is, is one more that the Treasury will be looking at, right? So all of this is um, in, in the bucket of administration, but um, to be clear, 80% of all of this will flow through states and municipalities for them to fight the pandemic on the ground. Um, so it's just something to note, uh, while it's a lot of money, 80% of it will actually flow to the specific states. 
Second, let me talk about expansion of programs. There are federal programs that are currently funded in part or full by the federal government that are going to see significant strain because of the COVID impacts on our people, right? So the federal government is adding funding into these programs through existing funding channels. So U.S. Department of Agriculture, right, um, that's very focused on food supply, um, so that is one example, providing loans for rural establishments. American farmers are starting the sowing season. If you were to take a drive into the country today, that's very much something that's happening, right, for food next year. And these loans and funds are very important for our food security. Funds added for emergency food support, school meals for children in need is another example. Um, the delivery of food gets very complicated as many schools are closed in our neighborhoods and expansion of childcare funds to support working families. Many of them are working from home while caring for their children and balancing homeschooling at the same time. A new program is stood up for pandemic unemployment assistance to cover uh, the self-employed and gig workers. On the public health care side, there are also changes to both Medicare and Medicaid programs to support COVID response for policy and member coverage. Um, so all of this is in and around the topic of expansion of programs, right? Um, the government is using as much as possible existing infrastructure and expanding the programs. Um, so you said 2.2 trillion, big number, right, Mike, earlier. Yep. Um, and all of that has to come with some new and additional oversight because it's 10% of the economy. The number's not small. Um, it is uh, something that we have to be uh, thoughtful and careful about. So the government is standing up additional oversight. Uh, there are various committees that are uh, coming about in the umbrella of oversight. And while the specifics are getting rolled out, including, um, you know, the IG, et cetera, um, that'll be uh, set up in the structure in and around that, uh, there will be uh, a lot more in terms of oversight and um, the details around that. There is a new committee created for pandemic response accountability to audit these funds. And the GAO, which is the General Accountability Office, will also have similar responsibilities as a new pandemic um, fund uh, inspector general uh, will be named. Sure, I've got a, a good friend that's a small business owner, a few hundred employees. Uh, this has obviously taken a significant toll on him. Uh, the silver lining is there is relief in the CARES Act uh, for small businesses. We've talked a bit about this um, already, but can you go into a little more detail about what is in the act and who is actually eligible for relief, specifically for small business owners? Sure. And he's certainly not alone. Um, so the bill, again, has about $908 billion of relief to businesses in it. About $350 billion is allocated to what they call the Paycheck Protection Program, which is the small business loan program in there. And the best way to describe this is that when Congress was pulling this proposal together, they were trying to figure out a way to get cash into the hands of small businesses to give them enough funding to keep people employed and keep the lights on for the next eight weeks. That's really the goal of the program is to give them enough money to, to do that for eight weeks. So the way this program works is it's, it's generally available to businesses that have 500 or fewer employees. Um, in some cases, it can be larger than that. For companies or businesses that are in the food services or accommodations industry, like hotels and restaurants, you can actually apply that 500 threshold on a per location basis. And then it gives you a loan that is based on your payroll costs. And then the loan is federally guaranteed. So you don't have to put up any collateral. You don't have any personal guarantees. It is a federally guaranteed loan. You can use that loan for things like payroll costs, rent, utility, and mortgages. And if at least 75% of it is used on payroll, you don't have to pay it back. So that's what's really appealing about this loan is it gives, it gives businesses this immediate cash, this immediate liquidity 
of which a good chunk of it may not have to be paid back at all, provided that it's used mostly for payroll costs and then also for things like mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. Um, it is the, the, the amount that can be forgiven is reduced if you lay off workers or if you reduce salaries by too much unless that employment is restored. And then the other sort of important thing to note about this loan is that if you take it, you may disqualify yourself from some of the tax benefits under the bill. And so you do have to sort of be aware of what all the different benefits are under the bill and make calculations about what is most useful to you. Um, I, I would say that I think this, this provision has probably gotten the most attention out of almost any provision in the bill because there's so, so much interest in it. And as the guidance has come out, it's been changing a lot and they've been restricting it just because the program is oversubscribed and, and demand is so high. So this is one of the areas where I really wouldn't be surprised to see expansions to it if we have more legislation coming up soon, given how popular it's been. Shahira, just as a practical matter, I'm a small business. What if I've laid off or furloughed some of my employees? Could I bring them back theoretically and then uh, be eligible for this loan? Absolutely. Um, that, that, is, that is the goal. So if you do furlough them or lay them off, if you bring them back by June 30th, then there's, there is no penalty. You basically get the loan forgiven again. And so you do have that ability to, to make the business whole and to make salaries whole. So that is the goal. I mean, the, the entire program is based around giving companies cash so that they can keep and maintain their payroll. And what are you hearing about ease of applying? It actually sounds based on how you described it, although uh, you also indicated it's oversubscribed, but is the process fairly straightforward? Um, that is a loaded question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes and no. Um, in a lot of ways, it is straightforward. They have a streamlined application process. It's, you know, it's, it's the front and back of one page. You don't have to go through a lot of the hoops and they do have the streamlined application and there's, you know, lenders are, are making the loans today. I think that the difficulty um, is number one, because the demand is so high and people were rushing to the door because the, this money, again, it's $350 billion and it's going to be awarded on a first come first serve basis. So the first applications were taken on Friday and there was a huge rush to get applications in because businesses are worried that the money is going to run out. And so that is kind of clogging the pipeline and clogging the system. I've heard that there have been issues, you know, even if loans are approved, kind of getting them through the SBA portal and, and finalizing them. So there, there are sort of the usual hiccups with having a, a program this big be up and running so fast. So, um, so yes, it is streamlined, but I think that probably the difficulty is just the amount of volume coming in right. and then also just sort of determining your eligibility with some of the, um, of, of the specifics of the eligibility rules. I'm going to go into a lightning round. So I'm going to be posing the same question to each of you. Um, and this is one where you could answer quickly um, and just give your perspective and we'll go through these. Um, and this first question is something that we've touched on, but really what I'm looking for is your opinion. Um, and the fact of the matter is obviously we've talked about a 2.2 trillion. It's significant, 10% of the economy. Um, I'd love to get each of your sense as to the impact that you think the stimulus will have on, on the economy. So Jonathan, I'll start with you. Caveat, Mike, I'm not an economist, but it does seem to me like the package passed by Congress last week was really robust. And if we get on top of this curve and are safe to emerge in the next six to eight to 10 weeks, I think Congress will have done pretty much what it needs to do other than maybe filling in some gaps where Shahira talked about some of the things where the law may not have been drafted quite perfectly. But if we end up in a situation where the pandemic continues for several more months, I suspect we'll be back at this with phase four, case five, case phase six. Shahir, what are your thoughts? Um, well, so I am an economist, although I don't like to admit that all the time. <laughs> but you know, I think that this bill is going to help. But the word stimulus is a misnomer. It's often referred to as a stimulus. That was not the intent of the bill. Um, this bill is really intended to be a tourniquet to stop the bleeding. You know, the government has ordered people to stay home. Economic activity is shut down while we're trying to flatten the curve and get the virus under control. This bill is intended to be a tourniquet to get 
cash into the hands of people who need it and businesses who need it. So I think it will help achieve that goal, but probably won't be enough, which is why I think future phases are going to be needed. And KP. Right. Um, So I'm not an economist either, but I definitely have uh, a point of view. I'm actually, um, I totally agree with both John and Shahira. It is uh, very much a focus of this is economic stabilization. So I think more will be needed in the future for stimulus per se. Um, But I do think the biggest impact here is the funds flowing directly to state, local municipalities where much of the COVID response is needed. Um, it's it's at the heart of communities where uh, this money needs to flow to and have an impact, Mike. People obviously are hurting. Um, we've talked about people losing their jobs. Um, it's an extreme time of stress. Our kids are at home. I mean, it's not easy. What advice do you have for you know, a common person out there that is struggling through this, that is, you know, the ones that are in greatest need, KP? Um, So I think my advice, um, Mike, is for people to raise their hand and ask for help, right? Not to be shy to ask for help. And help comes in multiple multiple forms, whether it is um, a neighbor, someone who is working at an agency who better understands processes, I think my biggest piece of advice is to raise their hand and ask for help. There are more people ready to do so than not. I'll echo what KP said. These are really difficult times. I have found a lot of help in doing you know, happy hours over the video chat with uh, friends and my teammates at work uh, just to kind of stay connected. The loss of the human interaction is really hard. All of us are social beings, even those of us who are somewhat introverted by nature and finding Strength among your friends and colleagues is going to help us all through this difficult time. And Shahira? A lot of people are hurting right now, not just economically, but emotionally as well. And I think that John and KP both said it really well. It really is about asking for help when you need it. This last one is a kind of a two-part question, but it goes hand in hand. And um, and you guys probably tell me, I think the bill was 700 and some odd pages of a big bill. So there's obviously a lot of information. We've only talked maybe for about 30 minutes today. So the question I have for you is if people want to learn more, um, where should they go? And, and let's couple that with if there's one thing that businesses um, should be doing today, or are you seeing them do well today? What is it? So let's start with, uh, we'll start with KP this time. Uh, I think uh, the first the first part, uh, Mike, is to uh, lean on the resources that are uh, available. Many private and public um, institutions are putting out webcasts and podcasts that help you deconstruct the bill and understand the bill better. It's 880 pages. Trying to decipher what matters to you is not easy. Um, And getting help on that and getting, uh, you know, resources tapped into, I think, is important. The second thing is uh, that you asked is, what should they be thinking about? And I think it's about optionality, just making sure that they're making choices, both with the short term and long term in mind. Right. Are you picking a loan and what kind of tax relief you might get in the future are all consideration that considerations that go into this optionality? Yeah, KP, I think that's actually a really important point, even beyond just the CARES Act, um, really kind of the, the the scenario planning or the optionality, as you said, because there's so many different choices that are in front of us. And quite frankly, how all of this plays out, we don't know. And so using that type of modeling or that type of scenario planning, I think is very helpful to organizations. And I've seen it at many of my clients. Uh, so Shahara, let's, let's, let's go to you on this question, which really is getting into where do they go for information and what's the number one thing that they should be doing at this point in time in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I think on the business side, almost every single business out there has an industry group or a trade association that is already looked at this bill, that already knows it inside out. They will be able to educate businesses about what's in it, what the bill does and what the options are. And so I think that's a good place to go. The Small Business Administration also has business development centers for small businesses 
in, at the local level. And so I think going to those resources to really educate themselves about the bill and learning what their options are is probably the most important thing. And I think the same for individuals is that there are a lot of community-based local resources that can help them figure out where the benefits are and so to, to lean on those resources. And John, how about you? I think businesses will be poised to do best if they act accordingly, which is to assume that they need, they need to plan not just for five or six or eight weeks, but for five, six, eight, ten months ahead of time. And so this is no time to come up short. This is a time for bold thinking and creative action. I, I love that as a way to end because that really plays nicely into the way that we've been framing up with clients around response. That's where we're at right now. Uh, but then there's going to be this time frame of recovering. And I think, John, what you're really getting at is start to think about how you can thrive long term because that's what's going to be critical. And sometimes uh, I actually was just reading an article yesterday about the number of businesses that were started during the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and the list is some of the most iconic businesses out there today. Uh, and so this really is an opportunity to think beyond uh, where we're at today. Thank you, KP, Shahira, and Jonathan. I'm so glad you're able to break the CARES Act down for our listeners, but a short podcast really can't do it any justice. We invite you to visit our COVID-19 Resource Center for timely updates, insights, and guides to help you act today. Visit Deloitte.com to find them all. If you have any other stories you want to hear more about, suggest them at Deloitte.com on our Resilient page. And for all of our Resilient episodes, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and even Spotify. Until next time, stay safe and remain resilient.